Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this Father's Day. Glad to see you here. Glad you've survived the storms that have been rolling through and were able to be with us. Um, I um, have a few announcements to make. Chad is in Chula and leading worship there with them this morning and asked if I'd be willing to take the entire service, which I'm glad to do and grateful. Uh, to be able to be with you again. My, my wife is in Birmingham. She is not with us uh, again. So Chad is out. Jonah is with the youth, I believe, on their way to Alabama for Johnny and Friends for the Summer Youth Project. And we'll be praying for them as well that God would use that time in their hearts and lives as well as for those that they'll be ministering to in this special camp that they'll be a part of family camp. Uh, there's several other announcements in the bulletin and prayer requests that I'd ask you to pay attention to, but the main one for today is to remind you ladies that there is a wonderful summer luncheon, ladies summer luncheon this Thursday, and if you have not RSVP'd and would like to come, uh, please call Diane Carroll and RSVP because they need an accurate count for those that can come. So please plan to do that and go. And I'm uh, frankly a little bit jealous myself that we are not invited. But um, you will have a wonderful time of fellowship. And there are many other things to take note of. So let us now uh, take a few moments and prepare our hearts as we come to our wonderful Lord in worship this morning. Our call to worship this morning is from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Hear the word of God. Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. 
Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom. You're exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hand are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. If you're able, would you please stand? Let's turn to hymn number 55 and sing together from our hearts to God be the glory. Wonderful Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as your people called by your name in this corner of your kingdom to worship you. And we do come to bring glory to your name, to praise you, and to thank you for all of your goodness, your care, your love. And in our hearts, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us. We're not worthy to come before you because of our sin, but because of your Savior for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, we approach the throne with boldness and grateful hearts. Hear our prayers, accept our worship, draw us close to yourself, and we pray all of this in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As believers in Jesus Christ, we repeat, as we do quite often, as saints have for centuries, those who've been called by the Lord Jesus Christ to confess with our mouths and our hearts what we believe. So Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born under the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he 
shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn our Old Testament reading. This morning is from the Pentateuch, from Deuteronomy, this being Father's Day, the decrees that God would call his people to observe. We read one of these in chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, the first 12 verses. Follow with me, if you would. These are the commandments, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses, and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Again, let's stand together, take your hymnals, turn to 76, let's sing Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Please stand.
be seated. Let's come before the throne together. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, as we come before you this day, we thank you for the gift that is ours and what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. We as your people recognize that you have been so merciful and gracious to us. Your kindness to us and your goodness to us is something that we can't comprehend apart from the gospel. And in this we come before you to bring adoration to your name, to worship you, to thank you, to confess our worthiness and yet accept your goodness to us. Lord, as we come before you, we thank you for the opportunity to lift one another up. We thank you for the privilege of being a part of what you do in this world, in the kingdom, in our lives, in our homes, with our friends and our families, in our work, those that we play with, those that we communicate with in various ways. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being able to be a part of others' lives as well. And Lord, we lift up so many different ones who have special needs and special cares. Father, we would pray for those that you have given us uh, that have special needs, special concerns, you know them. You know their hearts, you know their needs. We pray that you would draw them close to yourself to have a sense of your presence and the peace that comes with that. That you would give them a sense of your constant and loving care, your faithfulness to them. Lord, help us be hands and hearts that would reach out to encourage to strengthen, to have opportunity to serve and to care for them. Father, we particularly want to lift up our young people, for Jonah being with them as well, that you would work in their hearts, even as they would be praying that you would use them to work in the hearts of those that will be at the camp. The special needs that they have are only reflecting of the special needs that we have in ourselves, whether physical or emotional, relational. We recognize that we all struggle with various things. And yet you use those things to draw us to yourself. And we ask that you would do that even this day. Thank you for your care. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies that are new every day. Thank you that we have a sure anchor that holds. And in this, Lord, we hold to you, we cling to you, and we thank you for loving us so deeply and so richly. And so now, Lord, as we continue our time of worship before you, we ask that you would accept these gifts, these offerings, and pray that as they come from our hearts, Lord, that you would use them to build your kingdom both here and around the world. And in this, we give ourselves again to you with thanksgiving. In your sweet and precious name, we pray again, Lord Jesus. Amen. If the elders would come forward, or the uh, ushers, then we'll have our time of uh, offerings now.
Please be seated. This being Father's Day, I want to do something not typical in Presbyterian churches. I'd like to speak primarily to fathers. This morning, uh, the rest of you can eavesdrop if you'd like to, and uh, trust that perhaps God will use some of this for you as well. As a man myself, a husband, dad to two wonderful adult daughters, a wonderful son-in-law, and now a 10-month-old granddaughter, I am reminded of both the privileges and the responsibilities of parenting. Um, and the joys that come with it too. Our younger daughter, Joy, when she was about six years old, I remember so distinctly we were being playful and having a good time and she was laughing and she reached over and patted me on the leg. She said, Daddy, I don't ever want to grow up. And then she said, I want to be like you. <clears throat> There are a lot of men who kind of would fit into what they call sometimes the Peter Pan syndrome, the men who never grow up. Uh, and I trust that that's, in essence, really not where we are, that we continue to grow in this. So being prompted by this uh, National Recognition Day, I want to take a sort of different passage. Actually, a passage is, for many people, sort of flyover territory at the end of, end of the Newer Testament. Uh, the, the book of 3rd John, uh, very rarely actually looked at, and it has so much, I think, for us to offer in terms of what it means, thoughts of what it means to be a father. 3rd John is really a very short letter. It's in some ways, we might even think more of a note than it is a letter, but it's still packed, it's rich. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, we call them 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, although the author is not actually stated in any of them. Uh, but because the style and the syntax and the grammar is so like the gospel that we know is written by John, the one that he said Jesus loved, uh, that it has always traditionally been attributed to John. And uh, so we turn to 3 John, if you will, and we'll be looking at this. Now, John, uh, if this is indeed the one that we think he was. His father was Zebedee, he was a fisherman. And John was one of two brothers that Jesus uh, called to be disciples. They were busy, hardworking men in their family fishing business. And uh, Mark chapter three, Jesus says, without any explanation, he, he actually calls them the sons of thunder, which uh, when we get to heaven, that's one of the questions I'm gonna ask. You know, what, what did that mean? Um, was it their disposition? Uh, likely they were rough, tough men, which is all the more interesting because as we look at a letter like this, written by, as he calls himself, the elder, he's an older man writing to a younger man and, and giving him instructions, encouragement, as we'll see in a minute here. But it also talks about the work of God to mellow and to change and perhaps really make a difference in the heart and the life of this man as God would work on him as he works through him as well in the lives of others. But before we get to the text, I want to just take a moment because I think it's important, especially these days, to clarify what does it mean to be a father? It's more than a biological term. I hope it's obvious to everybody here that we all have biologic biological parents, but it's interesting in these days that we even have to make a clarification with the attack that is in our culture these days on the meaning of what it is to be a man or to be a woman. Things that God has created and God has strongly put into every one of us down to the cellular level of being one or the other biologically it's an uh, and, and beyond that is a, a sense of identity of what it means to be a man of what it means to be a woman with the gifts and the responsibilities that God designs 
We're not going to be talking so much about the biology of things, but we want to talk about the idea of what it means to be a father because it's distinct in some ways from that, although correlated as well. So we all have a father, a progenitor, a, progenitor, a biological half, with the exception, of course, of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we just said earlier in the, the Apostles' Creed, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, making him both fully human through his mother Mary, but fully God through the Spirit. The uniqueness of his being both God-man uh, at the same time. But even Jesus had, by God's design, an earthly father in Mary's husband, Joseph, who adopted him. They had other children, as we know from other sections of Scripture, but there is a sense in which he not only taught him the vocational trade of carpentry, but much more about life. So as we're looking at this and we're thinking about this, the term father, as we learn from Bible, the Bible is not as much a biological or a genealogical term, but much more importantly, it's relational. And that's what we'll be centering in on and talking about. It's a commitment to be involved, to be intentional, to help those that are younger, whether we are the biological parents or whether God gives us opportunity and relationships to be, as it were, a parent, a father for those that he would put into our lives and our hearts as well. I had a friend who was a biologist once, and it was fascinating talking to him because he, he talked about what biologists call tournament species of animals. And I was like, what are those? And he said, well, actually, they're the, they're the species in which the male is detached from the parenting. They, they produce, they sire the offspring, but the, the, the tournament species are the ones who actually don't get involved with the raising of the little ones, of the, of the things. They are Detached, he said, almost invariably, they're also ones that have showy plumage. They strut. They make big of themselves. They like to be competitive, often showing anger and territoriality about themselves. He said, there are lots of people that fall into tournament species as well. And interestingly, even as God has created nature, there's the opposite of that in nature of animals that are very committed to raising the young. Ones that you might not even think about, the Arctic wolf, marmoset monkeys, uh, Canadian gray geese. They are involved, they mate for life. If one of them is killed, the other one does not find another mate. They mate for life and they are involved in the raising. And interestingly enough, they're rarely showy they're rarely impressive, not the tournament species. So being a father is not the same as that male contribution to new life. And there are many examples in scripture that go beyond that bio uh, biological definition of being a, a, a father. Uh, we, we won't spend time in that, but I think of Paul and Timothy. Uh, Paul took on this influential relationship with his young disciple Timothy that was critical in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. He calls him, my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. So there was this bonding, this relationship that Paul had with Timothy. And, and Paul was used of God to build truth and wisdom in this man who, for what, as far as we know, he either didn't have a father that was anywhere on the scene or absentee or had no spiritual input into Timothy's life. And then we, we're going to be looking here in a moment in, in this letter, 3 John, the elderly, likely Apostle John, writing to a dear friend, somebody by the name of Gaius, uh, a younger man, a leader in the church who, who John takes under his wing. And he is writing to encourage and to instruct as a, a dear friend close commitment, one of his own children. So if you've got your Bibles, if you would, this is one of the rare times that we read uh, an entire book, if you want to put it that way, at one reading. Uh, third John, go to Revelation and turn back two short books to Third John, and listen with me if you will. 
the elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you're faithful in what you're doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such men so that we, we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and do you know that our testimony is true? I have much to write you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask even as we open our Bibles that you would open our hearts, that you would instruct us and encourage us, and that we would be all the more aware of your truth, that we would take it in and that it, you would use it to change us from the inside out. And in this, Lord, we give ourselves to you again. In your sweet name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So as we talk about being a father who isn't in heaven, let's look at three different aspects of this together. From this particular section of scripture, we want to first talk about being fathers who are loving our children in the truth. That's the first, loving our children in the truth. Second would be leading our children in the truth. Loving our children in the truth, leading them in the truth, and third, encouraging them to live in the truth. A father is one who is loving in the truth. Now, I think it's interesting that John writes, and we see as it begins in verse 1, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. He's not at all embarrassed or ashamed to verbalize his love. It's an encouragement to see that. He loves this man who's his son in the Lord. But notice that he does not just say that he loves him. There's a point to be made in this as we open this up, as we think about this. He tells him that he loves him in truth, which is quite honestly a most important and helpful distinctive. And it's especially true today. Six times in this very short book, John talks about the importance of everything being done in the truth, which is some wag has said, just tongue in cheek, you know, which is an amazing thing for a fisherman to be wanting to tell the truth about something. But he wants this to be love, love in the truth. Without truth, filtering what is love, then we are open to just about anything that wants to define itself as love or anything else. Or worse, we're open to everything. We have no ability to fence ourselves in terms of what is right and what is good, what produces long-term health and goodness, or what is destructive in itself, too. And when we talk about the term love, it's especially true that we need to love people in the truth. How much damage can be done with the name of love attached to it, divorced from truth? So where does that come from? Well, I don't think we have to talk too much about that. But John chapter 17, verse 17, when our Lord Jesus is praying 
to his father, his prayer is, Lord God, Father, sanctify my disciples in the truth. Your word is truth. That is the basis. That is the filter. That is the foundation. That is the gift that God gives us to have an anchor in turbulent times to, as a friend of mine back all the way in college days used to say, to have a combat knowledge of the Word of God in order to fight the spiritual war that we live in. Without that, we drift. Without that, we don't have the anchor that we need. And it's God's gift to us in his revelation of himself and his wisdom for us to live life that we hold fast to this and that we don't waver from that, that we use that as the filter that we need to determine. Even if somebody says with a smile, this is love, if it doesn't meet the criteria of what God tells us in his word, then it's likely to be bogus and we have to watch it. God gives us what we need. It's through the written word that we learn about life. It's through the written word that we come to know the living word, Jesus Christ. It's God's gift to us. It doesn't always fit with everything we want it to fit, but don't forget, God does not explain himself so much as he reveals himself. And in that, we're people who walk by faith to thank him and to live by what he calls us to have. So the truth that God reveals is, is what we need. And it will, quite frankly, make us different. To, be, to sanctify them in the truth means to set them apart. To be different. G.K. Chesterton, who was an Englishman, who was a writer, and C.S. Lewis considered him one of his uh, favorite authors, they lived uh, contemporaneously, but they never met each other. But L Chesterton was quite intelligent, and Lewis wouldn't write on certain topics because he said, Chesterton's already written on it. There's no need for me to look at it and talk about it. But G.K. Chesterton, in sort of a twist, made a comment that I've never forgotten. He said, instead of the passage that we know of, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. He said, as believers, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you odd because the world won't like what we say. Why should we be surprised? John tells Gaius that he loves him in the truth. So what does it look like? It means first to, first to be aware of what God has revealed, to desire that, to use that as the foundation, and by implication to understand and to be able to see what is false. I was watching a documentary at one point about counterfeit money. Perhaps you've seen something similar, but it was a study. It was, it was at one point, bankers had to go through this course on identifying counterfeit money. Tellers would do this as a routine. And the interesting thing to me was that they, instead of finding all the different various types of counterfeit money that they could find in order to familiarize them with them, they actually became so immersed in understanding what real money looked like and how to distinguish the real thing that it became an automatic response when the bogus stuff came across their path that they could just sense it almost immediately. That's where we need to be. That's what God gives us in order to be able to do that. But the other thing that comes out of this too is, is to love is to be an active participant, to be involved in the lives of those that God gives us, to share the truth with them. And I, I just notice in a passing thing in this, this letter is a short letter. Why? Because John wanted to get together with Gaius and talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, as friends, as brothers, as a father and his son. He's not content to have a casual, long-distance relationship. He says, I have much to write to you, but I don't want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we'll talk face to face. So to understand it, to love in the truth, naturally flows into the second area, to lead in the truth. To be a father is to lead in the truth. 
John wanted to spend personal time with him. And this is perhaps likely just one of many letters that John would write to Gaius, of which God would have us have the ones that we have to help us as he would deem important for us. But it reminded me as I was looking at this and as I was thinking about this letter, this personal letter that he writes to him, of the amazing commitment of what it means to be a father is to be involved, to be able to teach, to encourage on a regular basis. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to hear John Stott. The Lord's taken him home. He was a great influence. He's one of my favorite commentators, an Anglican minister. He came from a non-believing family. His father was a physician. His mother was very socially connected. Neither one of them wanted to have anything to do with Christianity. And John Stott was at rugby camp during the summer when one of his coaches shared with him naturally about knowing Jesus Christ, fascinated him. He became a believer. But his coach that has, had been such an important influence in his life, they separated that summer. They were not able to get together. And because they didn't have anything like what we have today and, and email connections and all these sort of things, the man that was his spiritual father, father, his name was Eric Nash, wrote to John Stott every week for years to encourage him knowing that he was living in an atmosphere that was not encouraging him, that really shamed him or tried to shame him in his new faith in Christ Jesus. And yet God would use this man in John Stott's life such that he would become a, a minister, a, a prolific author. One of the books that it's a classic, basic Christianity. It was written by John Stott and 50-something other books that he also wrote. But that, that illustration, and he became, by the way, the the, uh, one of the chaplains to Queen Elizabeth. And he was the pastor of All Souls. I actually had with a friend, we, we spent 30 minutes, this famous man at the narthex of the church, All Souls Langham Place in London, as he would just talk to us about our walk with the Lord. And it was just so natural passing on what he had also received from other believers too. The leading, the, the being a part of this constant stream of concern and contact. But as we look at this letter, I'm, I want to point out just a few things in this that talk about leading, because he's not afraid to point out examples of people to avoid. Like a good coach to him. Psalm 1 talks about, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. And John, in this letter, even takes it a step further to name names. He's saying, don't be like Diotrephes. Why? He loves to be first. He loves to play favorites. He likes to be the gatekeeper. And he's not accurate in his understanding of what Scripture calls us to be. And so he's even willing to say, if I get there, I'm going to call him out because it's not true. There's a, there is a point in which we, as spiritual fathers, as fathers as God calls us, there's a point in which we are to call out and say, this is trouble. Son, watch out. Be careful with, around this person, around those people. It's something that we are called to do, and it's good, and it's right. And I sense almost from this that remnant of the sons of thunder coming out of somebody who's really incensed that somebody would act this way and tells his son, don't do that. Don't be like him. But conversely, he's not just being critical of things. Look what he's also doing. He's also pointing out those who should be followed as a good example. Verse 11, don't imitate what's evil. In other words, don't be like Diotrephes. But what is good? Any man who does good is from God. Don't use don't be in that position. Don't follow a man who uses his place, his position, his power to promote himself. But he calls up Demetrius as someone who's a role model, as a person who is worth imitating. Good examples. I, I, I remember, I appreciated the head open coach for a while was Bobby Bowden, I mean Terry Bowden. He was a lead coach for a while, and, but I remember an interview with him in which he was talking about his relationship with his father, Bobby Bowden. 
And this is what he said, the thing, and Bobby, by the way, was a believer in Christ, both of them were. He said, my dad is a man with a life worth duplicating. I've never forgotten that, to have a life worth duplicating. That leads us to the third area. Loving in the truth, leading in the truth, living in the truth. What does it mean to live in the truth? I'd suggest from this that we see several things. The first thing to note is that John prays for Gaius. He tells him that he's praying for him, and he tells him what he's praying for. I'm sure this is not exhaustive, but at least this is on track with where he is. Verse 2, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. John wants his spiritual son, his child in the Lord, to do well in all aspects of life, even as we would want that for our children. It's not wrong to desire, even pray, that others have good health, that they prosper, that they do well in life. And in fact, the word used here, the Greek word that is translated prosper, literally means we would translate it a, a good career. That's good as long as it's undergird with that foundation, that filter of the truth that our soul would prosper as well. To have that God-seeking, that God-honoring inner life that shapes, that forms, that filters our outward endeavors. Uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 36, our Lord admonishes, what, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? We want all of that for our children as God would enable them to have this. So it is good, it is right to rejoice, to pray for, to celebrate a child's good academic records or sports achievements or promotions in life as long as we walk with them and encourage them to prosper in their soul as well. That's, that's reading in Deuteronomy chapter 6 which we did earlier as you were listening to this, it talks about you speak of these things in the way as you lie down, as you rise up. What's he saying? He says it's just woven into your life together. It's as, it's as easy to talk about the spiritual aspect of life as it is to talk about football or sports or hunting. When you're lying down, when you're rising up, it's not like this is the only thing you talk about. It's like it's all part of our life together. Don't forget these things. Ultimately, as somebody has said, apart from the godly life, there's really no ultimate good life. And that's where we should stand as well. Notice a couple of subtle things that come out of this as well in living this life too. Notice how he uses the metaphor of walking. His, his spiritual son, to hear him walking in the truth, it's a, it's a wonderful metaphor. It's a wonderful thing to reflect on. What does it mean to do this? The verse 4 is this wonderful verse. I had a friend who said it was, as a dad, it was his life verse. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Walking is one step at a time. It's in a direction. It's not a sprint. It's not one big leap. It's not something that's done one-seventh of the week when you go to church and check that off. It's a part of life, and it's walking one step at a time. And it means that it doesn't mean that everything is always Perfect. It doesn't mean that everything works out well. I'm having more fun now, even as many of you can relate to as fathers, as dads, watching my wonderful son-in-law with our little granddaughter who's 10 months old, and she's standing, and she's wobbling, and she's trying to take those first steps. And the fun thing, right now we're seeing most of it on videos, and it's, if they ever have another child, they probably won't have a tenth of the pictures that they have of this baby. But 
It's so much fun to watch them as we did too with a little child who's wobbling and trying to take a step and we cheer them on and they fall down. It's like, get up, let me help you up, let me do this. And I think that's what I need to be as a dad in a spiritual walk with our children. They take steps and sometimes they fall. And rather than ridicule or put them down or discourage them, it's like, get up, let's do it again, go again. I do remember so wonderfully with my wife and our children. I can say things, she's not here, to, you know. But she, when, when our girls were coming along in junior high and high school, and they, they would be hanging their head, and they'd say, oh, I made a terrible mistake. I did this. And we'd talk through it, work together. And, and then my wife would say, now go back and make a different mistake next time. And it gave them the freedom. It's not perfect. You're not. I'm not. It's progress. It's progress. Notice also, walking, notice John gets excited about this man's character. In these short verses, how many times? Verse 3, verse 5, verse 8, it talks about, it gives me great joy to have some of the brothers come and tell about your faithfulness in the truth. You're faithful in what you're doing for the brothers. You show hospitality of those working together. See, John is encouraging him, and he's calling out, and he's reflecting on Gaius's character and his reputation every bit as much as accomplishments. What's inside of you? makes me so proud because that's working out in how you're operating and what you're doing with other people. And he calls him out about it. He's doing it. He's saying you're hospitable. You're a team player. You're looking out for others. And he's quick to brag on him, particularly as a man of character. That's what he's focusing on. Let me tell you what people are saying about you. I hope you're embarrassed by it because it's exciting for me to be able to tell you how proud I am of you. Let me draw some thoughts together here. I'm aware, and particularly in the world, my wife and I were talking about this even this morning. There are people who come from really bad situations where family and fathers were not good influences. There could be some here. I've talked to many a person that on the outside everything looked great and they had horrible fathers. I had a friend who was a counselor and had a child once that he didn't know very well and the child, little girl, asked and said, you know, what's God like? And He said, well, and this was totally un plan, he said, because he had had a good, he said, well, I guess God in some ways is like your father. And she welled up with tears and ran out of the room. She'd had a terrible experience. Some of you had rough ones. Some of you had tournament species dads. I had a lady one time who said that her children had grown up in a no man's land. And when I smiled, she said, no, I'm serious. She said there was no man in their lives. But by God's mercy, many of you have had wonderful, not perfect, but wonderful fathers to learn from. And you consider yourself blessed, even as I do, even if they're not very flashy. I think in many ways we don't celebrate enough of those who are just steady walkers to do the right thing next. Not flashy, just steady. A true actual composition written by an eight-year-old boy that I pulled aside and filed away because I loved it. He was describing his father. The, the topic, he's eight years old, the topic is describe your father. My dad can climb the highest mountain or swim the biggest ocean. My dad can fly the fastest plane and fight the strongest tiger. He can do anything, but most of the time he just carries out the garbage. (laughs) There's a lot to be said for carrying out the garbage. To love in the truth, to lead in the truth, to live life in the truth, including taking out the garbage. 
So I've reflected on what it means as we celebrate this Father's Day. But perhaps it would be good because I think we'd be remiss if we don't talk just in these last few minutes of something that I think is really important to be especially thankful because we're so quick and we're so familiar, we don't recognize the joy that we have to be able to call God our Heavenly Father. Not only that he created us, but that he recreated us, that he gave us life in, in, in Christ Jesus, our Savior. And it's more than that even. It's to bring us into the relationship such that God would say, you're mine, you're, you're part of my family, you're special to me. Old Testament, foundational, you find the New Testament in the Old Testament, the Old Testament flowering in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God's people had to recognize the importance of God as the sovereign Lord and creator and the one to be accountable to. And when they're called to address God, they call him Adonai, they call him Jehovah, only they wouldn't say that because that would put vowels in it and that would be sacrilegious. Elohim, God, Lord, nothing about being father. It's only when Jesus Christ comes. It's only when he comes with the finished work of reconciliation that we're taught to address God as not just Lord, but as Father. When the disciples say, teach us how to pray, our Father who art in heaven. Jesus goes to heaven in his ascension. He says, don't touch me. I go to my Father and to your Father. This is something, because we're so steeped in what we've been taught, we don't recognize that no other religion in the world would think about calling the Creator God as Father. How is it possible for us? It's because of what Jesus did. Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of, your, of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, that means father. Actually, it translates better what we would say dad so that you are no longer a slave but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you heirs. For all of our sin, for all of our struggles, for all of our desire to grow in grace and falling flat, do you realize that that is how God sees me? That's how God sees you? You're not an alien. He's not up there looking at you saying, well, if you mess up one more time, you're out of here, dude. He's a father. He's the one who is saying, come on, get back up. Come on, get up. This is not who you are. This is who you are. That we are that way before him. And not only that we've been brought from death into life, but we've been made the family. Heirs of the kingdom of God. We can't even begin to think of what that means. Eye has not seen, ears not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. You think you have an idea? You don't. But isn't it our privilege to encourage our covenant children to grow in this? Isn't that where we are? I'm a, I'm a, just one, one more thing that I want to look at. Years and years ago, before I ever met my wife, Denise, before God gave us the privilege of coming together as, as a couple and then as family and the children, I, I remember someone reflecting on a passage most of us are familiar with, somewhat Matthew chapter 3. Again, in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus at his baptism, he comes up out of the water, a voice from heaven, the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Happens again at his ascension. Same voice from the Father. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
And the speaker that I was listening to said some things. I wrote them down. He said, it was not just an affirmation of the Father for the Son and his mission, but it was the verbal affirmation that every son desires to hear from his dad. This is my son. You belong to me. We're in this together. Second, my beloved son, I love you. Third, in whom I am well pleased. You make me proud. Fourth, listen to him. His mission matters in life. He has something to say. Pay attention. And the speaker ended by saying, what son wouldn't thrive with a steady diet of this? John does the same thing. That wasn't just for Jesus. Look at this. He's bonded in love with him. My dear friend, my child, whom I love. He's bonded with him in verse 1 and 2. He loves him and he tells him that. He prays for him in verse 2. He rejoices to hear good things about him and encourages him in his walk and his ministry and his calling. It's for our children. It's for us. It's for each of us. It should be what all of us desire to do for one another. One last, one last thing. My, my wife, when, before God gave us our daughters, Denise looked at me one day and she said, Guy, you know what I think our job is going to be if he gives us children? I said, okay, I'll bite what? She said, I think our job is to build a crown over their head and encourage them to grow up into it. I have no greater joy than to see my children walking in the truth. Thanks be to God who gives us the grace to be instruments like that in each other's lives. Isn't it amazing to be a Christian? Father, thank you for your word that we can grow in grace. Father, help us to be bold in what is right and good, to say what we ought to say, to withhold what we should not say, to be wise and discerning. For all of us called to be fathers, for all of us called to be parents, but for all of us called in our place to encourage and care for one another, would you so work in our hearts that we would rejoice in what we are heirs of and that we would encourage one another in our walks before you. This to your honor and glory as well as for the good of your people. Lord, we give ourselves to you again. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. If you're able, let's stand together. Let's turn to our wonderful hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 32. Let's stand and sing together.
morning by morning, new mercies I see. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, receive his blessing and his benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.